All right. Well, welcome everybody. So great to be reconnected in 2021, and I hope everyone's staying healthy. And your your new year has started off um, a little differently than maybe 2020. Uh, we are back into our routine with the best practices master classes. We're going to continue this throughout 2021. So we're very excited uh, to, to continue the conversation. Our intent here is really to create more community to support our subscribers as much as we can. And, and ultimately to you know, even start connecting you all as coaches together. Uh, you've got this great common methodology or at least some boundaries using this platform of coach metrics. And we just envision a day where we can be collaborating on projects and connecting with each other. Uh, quick couple of just quick logistic items. I mentioned this to Bill a little bit earlier. We're gonna send a survey out after the um, conversation today we would love your feedback, especially around topics and how we can improve these sessions. So uh, we're, we'd love uh, to, to get that feedback from you. And then uh, as we go through the masterclass today, uh, keep your um, mic on mute, but feel free to come off at any point in time. These are intended to be interactive, love questions, love feedback along the way. So come off at any point in time, but the mic helps to minimize the background noise. If you uh, didn't get a chance to join us in December, we looked at the customer journey and that masterclass is up on the community page. So feel free to check it out. That was really less about coach metrics and more about mapping out that customer journey and how you can think through your sales and your marketing strategy for 2021. Um, our roadmap today, today is all about pulse feedback. And so we'll touch on a couple of things around pulse feedback, um, but we're gonna do really kind of a deep dive into what pulse feedback looks like. We'll start with some observations, just what are you seeing in the marketplace? It's nice to, when we've got coaches across the country on the same call to just get a sense of what you're noticing. So we'll start there just for about five minutes, but then we'll get into pulse feedback. Why is pulse feedback important? Uh, I will talk about the pulse, some mechanics around pulse feedback how you create some, your settings, uh, some best practices around using the action plan, how you might think about frequency of your pulse feedback and things like that. And then finally, we've got a couple of other best practices that we're, we'll share. So that's where we're headed in the conversation today. And um, uh, mark your calendar for our uh, best practices master classes in February and March. We're trying a different time, you might've noticed, Last year, we did most of the sessions at noon. Today, we're starting at 10 mountain time. So we're just gonna see how that impacts people's availability on Fridays, February 19th, March 19th. And, and we'll announce the April, May, June dates here, uh, probably in the next month or so. Uh, if you've been on these master classes, you've seen these couple of slides. I just want you to know mostly that Coach Metrics is a platform built by coaches and made for coaches. We started to notice challenges in our own coaching programs when action plans were paper-based we noticed that people either weren't doing them to the extent that would really drive behavioral change or there wasn't the transparency with key stakeholders that there we believe there needed to be we also started noticing like people were moving in training and coaching sessions to more of this electronic format not bringing pens literally to workshops and wanting availability of resources and tools on their mobile devices. And so we saw a need for that. And then of course the measurement component, that's what we're here to talk about today. So help us build this platform. Uh, we've got some big goals for 2021 and uh, your input is really critical to helping us shape what we do. We do listen. Um, it, in fact, um, uh, Thea who may be on this call today had suggested we make some changes to the resources feature where you, uh, allow coaches that might be on your team to be able to access and share resources. We are in the process of making that change right now, but that was direct feedback from one of our subscribers. So we love feedback. Can't necessarily promise we'll do everything, but we do listen. And, and uh, so we ask that you help us shape the platform. So just a, a quick, maybe five minutes here. It's just nice again to sink in. We've got about 10 people on the call right now. What are you noticing as we enter 2021 what are you noticing about the market, maybe about what clients are doing, how are sales, and what are some ways in which you might be shifting or pivoting your business? So I'd just like to open it up for a group discussion here. What are you noticing out there today and how are you shifting or pivoting your work?
So I'll Excuse start. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I jumped on late. I was on the old time frame. You're good. <laughs> Sorry about that. I know. That's what we, we're <laughs> making a shift here today. I had to remind myself too. Yeah, I was just like, oh my God. And then thank God the Zoom reminder came up or I'd still be doing something else. Good. Um, so what am I noticing about the marketplace and clients and sales? Um, I think there was a real pause around the Christmas and, and New Year's holiday, but it's been very strong since then. Um, and a lot of requests around team development, collaboration. Uh, I think the remote workplace has taken a toll on collaboration. And so people are asking for more feedback, more tools around that and the team development. The other thing that's been interesting to me is I've had clients now requesting they want to go back. They're three to four timers with the survey and they want to go back and survey again. So there seems to be oh, this kind of fresh start concept, I guess I'll call it, um, with that piece of it. Um, and I think we're going to see, you know, more and more I think that I think there's going to be a rise in business as there's a rise in vaccines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you we know? should. We should, hopefully we'll see a correlation. Yeah, direct correlation with that. I've been busier than normal. Okay, good to hear. That's terrific so, yeah. news. What a great way to start 2021. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. far awesome, so good. Awesome, Susan. Thank you. Are you doing anything to shift or doing anything differently in 2021? Not really. I, you know. Um, what this period of time has given me is there's just a slowness. And so I feel I'm actually better for my clients because I have more time to do research, more time to study tools, more time to listen to webinars. I see Lori mm -hmm. nodding her head. It's like, I feel I'm a better consultant because I, I have less distraction, right? You, yeah. you can really hyper-focus yeah. in on what, need, what they need. And that's why I was almost missing this call. I was reading something and I was totally engrossed with it. All right, so... Awesome. It is what it is. What it is. Okay. Yep. So no major shifts, but you're, you're finding the time to just be a little more present with your coaches and get, doing that research and, and being a, a better resource, if you will. Great. Susan, great. Thank you uh, for that. How about others? What are you noticing as we start this year? What's changing, shifting? What are you doing differently? Hi, Lori. Hi. So it has been an uh, super promising start to 2021. I'm really excited about all that's ahead. And I don't think I even had the slowdown around the holidays. The, the pandemic has really brought forward a whole new level of dysfunction. And mm. it, it got to the point of being painful for, for people. And so they were starting to reach out and, and asking for support. So it's been fun. I think my biggest pivot has been my First pivot was no travel to see my clients, to work with yeah. teams and get hands on and get dirty with them. So that was the first pivot. And now the, the, the pivot, I, cause I went to online, but now it's some folks are starting to start wanting to talk about in person again and, mm. you know, trying to, to figure out, you know, if that's a, a good idea and if it's not, what are my solutions for them? Yeah. Great. Good to hear, Lori. It sounds like a nice start of the year for you. Yeah, we're starting yeah, to notice that as well. The conversation or at least the planning around what does the future look like when people start to get back in the office? Uh, any other reactions? What are you noticing in the market, Tasha? Well, I was going to say for us, you know, we were doing all in-person business. And then with the pandemic, we had to convert to virtual and so as we made that pivot, what we've noticed with our clients is um, there's more focus now on individual work. People are realizing, mm. you know, I need to kind of grow in this area. I need to be better in this area. Whereas when they were in the office and I think they had a big team around them, it was easier to get covered, you know, those dysfunctions to be covered up yeah. or those weaknesses to be disguised because you had three other people in the meeting with you and but now you're on a Zoom call and it's all about you and it's what you de delivered and what you bring into the table. And so what we've noticed is we're having more people ask for one-on-one -on -one, um, executive mm. present type coaching. So we're working with people to try to help them in that sense of having that more executive presence where they can make new moves and go up in their leadership. And so 
Interesting. For us, I think that's really what I've been finding is clients want more independent work, more personal development and assessing themselves pretty frankly about where they are and where they need to grow. So that is a change from when we were just working with developing teams. I feel like now yes. we're getting more requests to work with individuals. Yeah, and I really terrific. Like that anyway, because I feel like you can really hone in on the people. But um, mm -hmm. that's kind of what we've done. And what we, I had left Coach Metrics for a little bit and we just started using it again. I told my partner about it and he started using it with some of our one-on-one -on -one coaching clients. And that's why I decided to get on this call because I want to make sure I'm maximizing it because I really think with so much focus on individual development that there's so yeah. many parts of this tool that we could use to really help encourage them and push them along and be accountable to them or help them be accountable to the growth that we see and that we want them to have. So um, I think that's where I see the trend going in our group of clients is more independent one-on-one -on -one coaching. Awesome. Great to hear, Tasha. It sounds like the, the theme here, at least from three people, is off to a positive start. You're seeing more one-on-one -on -one work, um, different than your focus on teamwork in the past. It's been great to have you back on Coach Metrics. Thanks. Well, I'm going to keep going so we spend the majority of our time today focusing on pulse feedback. So thanks for, thanks for that. Just nice to kind of dip in and get a sense of, of where people are today and, and what you're noticing. Let's talk about pulse feedback. And the first thing I wanna mention is just a couple of reasons why we think this is important. Number one, if you can measure your results as a coach, I think you automatically set yourself apart from most coaching businesses. Coaching's all about behavioral change. I would say 95% of coaches out there don't measure behavioral change, or at least not to the level of extent that, that I think we should be in leadership development. So. There's, there's a great, uh, you know, some great selling messages. And I think earlier in the summer, the recordings on our community page, we heard from some coaches on some of the messages they're using in their pre-sales and their sales conversations around having a data-driven approach and metrics and, and being able to prove your um, behavior change. Uh, number two, it just is really helpful to keep coaches and frankly, coaches accountable that ongoing rhythm of getting feedback and then updating your action plan and getting more feedback and updating your action plan can really help drive that change. And then finally, what we're noticing, we've, we've, you may have seen on our blog, we've been um, spotlighting some coaches that have been using coach metrics. One of the themes that we're hearing is that coaching engagements are getting extended in part because of this pulse feedback process. So a lot of benefits to the coachee, and to your sales process and to your business as well. So I'd love to start with your questions. And in your chat box, um, type any questions that you have about the Pulse Feedback feature that you want answered by the end of this conversation today. And Robin, our lead uh, from a client success uh, and our client success team is also on the call. So she's going to keep track of that. But if you've got some questions about Pulse Feedback that you want to make sure we take a stab at answering today, please type those into your, um, into your chat box and I'll keep an eye on that as well. Um, all right, so we're, we're going to talk about Pulse Feedback from a few different standpoints. Um, we're going to talk about project settings. We'll talk about what's required in the action plan. We'll talk about actually automating the Pulse Feedback process and then some additional strategies um, around using pulse feedback. So um, what we found as we've talked to subscribers on our support team is um, many folks don't know that there are some project settings that you can set up when you create that initial project. And so Tasha, even for you, this might be a reminder to, um, to check this out. And I'll demonstrate what these are, but you can set the number of rounds that you um, create for your project. You can adjust the format and uh, how you use the scale. Um, you can set different privacy levels and you can also create reminders. So I'm gonna go over to our demo account and uh, we're back with the Acme executive team. And, and this is the project page that you might be familiar with. And, uh, as you probably know, when you initially set up the project and you create your participants, the data won't be there because there isn't any data um, 
from the project at that point in time. So that data sort of dynamically starts to emerge once the pulse feedback is set up. But when you set up your project, um, it's really a simple process of just adding the project name. You can then come into this, this little wheel icon on the right-hand side, gives you the option to make some adjustments to your project setting. So you can change the name of the project if you need to. You can adjust the number of pulse feedback rounds if you need to. By the way, this, this number you can adjust at any point in the project. There are other settings that once you set them and you start pulse feedback, those settings are locked. Um, you can adjust the pulse feedback type. So uh, we've kind of labeled these um, as a traditional format, which is really like a, a Likert scale one to five or one to 10 or one to a hundred. Um, and you can, uh, once you get into each participant's um, profile, you can see that data in both a line chart or a bar chart. And then the other scale, this is the scale that we tend to use in our practice. Um, this is what we call a progress format scale. And really it just means it's a negative scale to a positive scale where zero represents no change. So um, when you see a client see, with negative numbers, it means they're actually getting worse in relation to that behavioral change. If you see positive numbers on the scale, they're getting better. So we like this scale. It's part of the stakeholder center coaching methodology that Marshall Goldsmith developed, and it just really helps us indicate whether that client's moving or not, uh, moving the needle or not. So you can choose your scale, and then at the initial outset of the project, you can adjust the scale. So if you prefer that progress format scale to be negative seven to positive seven, or if you want your uh, traditional format to be one through 100 or one through 50, you can adjust that here. And then you've got some privacy settings. Um, the default for this privacy setting is what we call partially anonymous, meaning um, the avatars of each of the supporters will be darkened out. So you can't tell who has made the comments. If you choose the open format, uh, you'll know exactly who provided comments and feedback for your pulse feedback. And then um, you have the ability to um, set the feedback reminders and what will happen is if a supporter or a participant does not respond to a pulse feedback request, if this enable reminder emails box is checked, it will send out three follow-up reminders. So let me pause there for a minute. It's important to just know your settings and um, to understand how they work. What questions do you have about any of the project settings? So Sal, so, uh, oh, Susan, I was gonna speak for you. She wants to- Go ahead, do awesome. it. I'll go Great. after you. Well, no, right. I was uh, reiterating your chat. So Susan said, can you change the anchors on the rating scale? And the, um, uh, by anchor, Susan, what are you referring to? Right now we've got this rating scale with thumbs up at one end and thumbs down at the other end. Is that what you're yeah. referring to? Well, I was wondering if there's any ability to customize it in terms of more of a frequency measure, how often people see the behavior, or you know, trying to get a, trying to get it a little bit more customized versus strongly agree to strongly disagree. Could we do frequency? Could we put other descriptors in that rating scale? Mm. Um, and I'll tell you specifically why I'm asking that. So yeah, I do great, a lot of work question. with the five behaviors. And yes. I love about, what is it, three webinars ago, you got this great idea of using the follow-up, right? And following yes. up with coach metrics. But the rating scale on the five behaviors is really about frequency. A lot of times, how often do you see things and that type of thing. But then you take that and then you have to kind of transition the rating scale. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so could, I do. We yeah. could we customize it so it's more of an apples to apples comparison? Yeah, that's great. Um, so we'll go to Brian next. Um, right now, we can't in, in okay. terms of the system. I think there might be a workaround or two, but it, that is something, Susan, that's come up more and more right. and is on our radar. Brian, did you have a question in regards to that as well? I was just going to um, reinforce that as well. I use the leadership circle yeah. profile assessment and yep. um, the core of that is the frequency of behaviors observed. Um, so that would tie in very, very well with that. Um, 
somewhat related the question I typed in here a minute ago is I, I elected to go with the traditional format just because I wasn't been that I've only yeah. done one of these so far I'm in the middle of it the first time um, I'm on round three now but I elected to do traditional format instead of progress format one of my questions was kind of thinking in terms of and one of the reasons I shied away from it was the very first time we evaluate like what's our basis that we you know how do we either describe to the supporters or how do we set up like okay, this is where we're starting from. Um, I, I, that was part got me a little squirrely, I guess. I don't know if you yeah, have any thoughts. Yeah, gotcha. That. We, that, thanks for asking that question because we get that one quite a few times too. So let me go back to the frequency, then we'll get back to the, um, that baseline question. Um, you know, I would say a potential workaround could be, and Robin, feel free to jump in if you've heard of any others. Um, could be um, to add some context within the behavioral statement question. Um, so it could be something like, how frequently do you see Susan um, displaying X, Y, and Z, X, X behavior? So that might be a short-term walk around, or work around, but I think you're right. We're starting to hear from more coaches that they wanna change what that looks like. And, Brian, we're very familiar with Leadership Circle. We use that in our coaching practice as well. So and it's a really great tool. And we use five behaviors too. So we can we can access those scales to maybe get a sense of how we might be able to anchor those differently. So yeah. the short answer is right now, technically in the system, you can't change the anchor, but there's probably a workaround or two. Robin, did you have a thought? Yeah, that that is the best workaround. And so, you know, whatever is populated within that behavior text box will be displayed on the survey. And, and maybe Sal can show you, you can view yeah, the survey right before now. it's sent out. Um, and I've heard from many coaches that is how they anchor their scale. So they will put in the definition, one equates to this value. Um, so you can customize that for each and every individual, if you like. Um, but we do have it on our radar to provide that automation where you can define it and it will automatically populate whatever anchors you have on the survey. Yeah, so um, Brian and Susan, you know, these fields are all, you know, you can put anything you want in these fields. So this would be the place to put that additional, th this behavioral statement would be the place to put that additional context because this is actually the survey question. And then Robin mentioned something important, which is um, when you're setting up your pulse feedback, you can actually look and see what the exact survey will look like. And um, we just, this has always been here, but we've made some changes to this page recently to hopefully make it a little bit more usable. But if you click on this link underneath automatic pulse survey, you'll see the survey that's gonna go out to those supporters. And so this is exactly what will show up. At the top, it's gonna to let you know what round of feedback um, has been requested. It'll tell you how long it's gonna take. Um, there's the survey question and then the survey with your scale. And so there's no anchor here, as you're mentioning, Susan, besides the thumbs up, thumbs down. If you add some context in this question, then it would add context to the anchor. Again, we, we wanna be able to to change that, we, we hear that loud and clear. Um, and so uh, the other piece, so let me pause there and then I wanna respond to Brian's second question about the baseline. Any uh, questions either about anchoring or viewing the actual survey that would go out? All right, so uh, Brian, you mentioned the, the um, the the um, the baseline. So what what we tend to think about as the baseline is whatever 360 or assessment you're using. So if you're using the leadership circle, and it's a one to five scale, you might set up your um, pulse feedback to be identical to that one to five sale scale. So your 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 baseline is really the result that's coming out of that leadership circle survey, and then coach metrics becomes the follow up. Um, measurement after that survey. And one thing that also starts to show up in this survey um, that I'm showing on my screen right now, if I'm a supporter, 
it will show me how I have assessed that leader for prior rounds. So we're using a scale of negative two to positive two in this particular example. If in the last round, I gave Greg Smithy a, uh, a score of one, that will show up here. So I know what I gave him last time and it'll help me be more consistent as a supporter with my pulse feedback for this next round. So we tend to think about the baseline as whatever assessment was first delivered and, um, and then pulse, the pulse feedback process is, is what comes after. Brian, reactions to that or does that make sense or what's your thinking? Yeah, so, and I'm just sitting here thinking this through, like, and I think now that I'm thinking it through a little bit deeper, I'm also remembering why I shied away from the the up and the down, the plus and the minus, because part of that I really yeah. love, like, are we getting better or are we not? Um, you know, as I was just looking before we jumped on this call at a second round for the only one of these I've set up so far, I noticed that there are several people who um, I'd set up on a one to five scale, Several people gave this individual number four, and then they made comments like, wow, I've seen such a change, and they were very positive and encouraging things. As I look at that example that you just shared, if I feel like someone's doing it to the level I feel like is appropriately, and they've continuing to do it appropriately, and I put it as a zero, it may appear that the person isn't doing what they're supposed to do. And I don't know if that's maybe more philosophical on the, on the scale, but if you have any thoughts on that, and we don't have to go too far off topic, but if you have any sort of quick thoughts that might be helpful, I'd love to kind of wrap my brain around that because as I look at this person's feedback, about half the people feel like that this gentleman is doing what he's supposed to be doing on these topics now. Um, yep. And I feel like they'd be showing up as zero, but then I'd be, I'd be saying, you know, is he really improving? Does that make sense? I think so. You're on a one to five scale. That, which yeah. is different than this scale here. So this scale zero actually represents the leaders not hasn't made any change. So the the and one so, to but five, it, but if, but if, yeah. But if part if part of the supporters felt like mm -hmm. the leader is doing good, I think that's part of my thing. So if you if we're interviewing ten people, we're getting feedback from ten people, and three or four of them didn't sort of sense these same issues that the other six did, you know, they're scoring right. them as he's doing great and he, and he's not changing. He doesn't need to change. I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. like, I don't want to go too far off topic, but if there's a, a nugget or two that might be helpful on that, that would be, that would help me kind of go, well, maybe I'm just looking at it wrong. And this is a, a yeah. this does fit my way. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm, uh, if I'm totally grasping your question, Brian, um, there, there are different types of scales. So, um, you know, it, on the, on the traditional one to five scale, the way that I tend to think about this, this may or may not be helpful is if I see a leader very consistently scoring in that four to five range over time, you know, that's about when we can start thinking about, okay, the leader has really gotten that behavior down and we, we might start thinking about shifting his or her action plan. Um, whereas on this scale, this is really more about are they, um, are, are we seeing some change or not? And zero represents, we're not actually seeing the leader make any change. So I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm answering your question. I'm not 100% sure. Um, uh, it may, and maybe someone else has some thoughts on responding to, to Brian's question, Susan? So I had the exact same situation Brian had about three, four years yeah. ago when I used that scale. And, um, and I had to spend a lot of time explaining it because people thought that mm. a zero meant that, the, that it was a zero, a zero is a zero from, you know, uh, that that's a not, not a good thing. And so right. we had to explain to people, even if you score in the middle is the same, that's not a bad score. It's just where you see that behavior. Does that make sense? But Brian, am I answering a question? Cause I had to explain it several times over to people because they, they, got confused by that zero middle point mm -hmm. I don't know yeah perhaps. yeah I mean I, I think it makes sense I think my fear is and especially with the level of leader that I'm working with and the level of supporter that I'm working with right if I need to do a polite energy into explaining for people who are busy at high levels that that I feel like might damage my credibility yeah. if I've got to yeah. really put a lot of energy in on that um right. But yeah, and maybe it's just as simple as the reality is. I mean, right. 
it's interesting as I was reading this person's feedback, you know, feedback from about 10 people, um, a lot of them are very positive. And I'm, I'm, I'm questioning myself, like, did we pick the right things to work on? Um, yeah. But it, that could be it's it. interesting yeah. on this. It's just interesting on this idea of uh, whether no change means okay. if no change is bad or no change right. is it's fine. This person doesn't have an issue with interrupting in meetings. I, I haven't seen it in my meetings. You know that that's like someone that's some of the answer yeah. there. So I got yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hey, I got Brett. I got the same thing, and then I had respondents saying to me, "Well, I scored it as a zero, but I didn't see it as a problem, you know." And I mm. said, "That's fine, you know." And what I encourage people to do is to share what they're observing in the comment, which helps you, um, yeah. you know, explain yeah. it, you know. And then I always tell people, "No score is a bad score, right?" Sal, can you point clarify the real quick? If there's maybe this yeah, one go ahead and then we'll, and then we'll go to Bill. Yeah, go for it. The so the uh, um, do the scores and the comments. I, I forget. Do we see them side by side? So can we see? So a person who yeah. put a comment and that said this person's excellent. We see right beside that the fact that they gave they would have given a zero score or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Let me show you Greg's Greg's score. So you'll click on this pulse feedback link underneath his name. And then as you scroll right. down, you'll see, yeah, you'll see the open-ended comment, which is really intended to be feed forward. So it's intended to give that leader ideas for the future. And then you'll see uh, how that particular supporter scored Greg. Now that I see that, then, I'm reminded that I could, you could just eyeball the zeros and say, right. you know what, most of your zeros are people who already think you're good at this. So we don't have to worry about it. that's gosh, that just, I should have yeah, looked at that that's first. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And one other thought, um, well, I was going to say you could, one thing that we've done is we've created a resource explaining how the process works. And so that's, you could create a resource in Coach Metrics and then share that with your, um, with your participant, giving them the language on how they could enroll or should enroll their supporters. So I do think what's really important, and if I, if I go back to you know, some of Marshall Goldsmith's thinking, part of the methodology that he has with stakeholder-centered coaching is you get clear in what you're going to work on, you go public with that, and you enroll people verbally in the process. So as opposed to just adding them to Coach Metrics and letting Coach Metrics send an email, um, have a conversation with them. Hey, this is what I'm working on. Will you be part of my journey? And at that point in time, you could even give them some language around what the scale would look like. Mm -hmm. Let me go to Bill. Bill, I think you had a question we didn't get to. Uh, no, I was just gonna add into Brian, a simple uh, thing that I do. I'm a Marshall Goldsmith stakeholder center coach. And uh, so the, just phrasing the uh, feedback, uh, how, have, how has Brian done over the last three months? is how the questions were. So they're only evaluating the last three months. So everybody has an ebb and flow, right? Because I usually do 12 month engagements. That simple wording I think has an impact on, on the, mm, the meeting. That's the really schools. good. That's a great do example. The, do you use the, uh, the plus minuses or do you do a straight scale, Bill? Uh, plus minus is three, ne negative three to positive three. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's sort of the standard uh, Marshall Goldsmith methodology. But Bill, thanks for that clarification. I think that's really helpful to give that, give that the time frame for that rater. Uh, so if it's over the last 45 days, how has the leader done over the last 45 days in this area? I like that frame. Um, I'm gonna keep going. So remember those project settings, a couple of uh, just key reminders. Once your pulse feedback starts, you cannot change the scale. So if that first round goes out and you say, really, I want that scale to be one to seven instead of one to five, that scale is locked for your project. Um, so just keep that in mind, that's really uh, important. You can change the number of rounds of pulse feedback that go out. Uh, the second area that we wanted to just touch on is the action plan because the action plan is really what sets up the pulse feedback process. So that behavioral statement is really key. We've heard a couple of different ways now in which people are using that statement. Um, that 
statement is ultimately the survey item. And that's what your supporters and the participant will see with that pulse feedback survey. A couple of other things that we want to point out, just this is probably a reminder for, for most of you as well. Um, if I um, go into the goal itself, remember that there's a share action plan button. And once you have a goal in the system, um, you have the ability to share that action plan. It shows you an image of what will be shared. It doesn't give people access into coach metrics, but sends the action plan out to others. And then the participant can send it to anyone they choose. Uh, they can send it to their coach. They can send it to themselves. They can send it to any of their supporters if their supporters are already in the system. And if they're not, you can add additional recipients in, um, in this field. So we think this is a, uh, it's an underused feature, but part of the process is get clear in your action plan, but make sure you calibrate that action plan between the coach, the participant and their manager so you don't get to the end of the engagement and say, great, Greg worked on all these things, but he focused on the wrong thing. So that feature is there. And then of course, there's the, the comments feature that allows you to comment either between sessions or maybe give some advice or feedback on how that action plan is shaping up. Uh, and so it's a, it's a nice way to check in with your coachee in between, uh, in between coaching sessions. Any questions on how the action plan works? All right, so adding supporters, a couple of key things. So one, you've got your project settings set up. Number two, you've got your action plan in place. Uh, number three, now we're gonna start to add our supporters. And the process itself is, uh, is pretty simple. It's just underneath the goal area or the action plan area. And you're just gonna add the, part, the supporter's name and email address. You can choose to select the standard welcome message that is here. And as soon as you click on add supporters, the supporters that you added will be attached to all of the goals that are already in the system. Okay, so by default, all supporters get attached to all of the goals. Now, some goals that your leaders might be working on might not be applicable to all of the supporters you added. So you can remove your supporters from goals by clicking on the goal, edit the goal, and then if, you know, assuming these were all checked before, if you don't want Steve Smith to be included on that pulse feedback survey, just remove Steve Smith and Steve won't receive that pulse feedback survey. So let me pause there. The, the enrollment of supporters is really key verbally, then add those supporters into coach metrics, either the coach or the participant can do that. And then the big watch here is to make sure that you realize that once you add those supporters, they get attached to all of the goals and you'll have to remove those supporters if you don't want some supporters to respond to some of those pulse feedback statements. So uh, questions, reactions to that, that makes sense? All right. Brian? So if you could take a just a step back, um, Brian's got a question yeah. on updating action plans, the statements for evaluations are staying the same, correct? Uh, Brian, uh, give me a little the more goals. context here. I think that yeah. maybe the terminology is the goals. So like if we're, we talk about updating the action plans, that that isn't, I just wanna make sure I understand it correctly. That isn't changing the statements that we're getting ratings on. That still stays the same. We may just be changing some that's nuances correct. to how they achieve that behavior. Yeah, that that's very good point. I was going to bring that up later. This is really key. So, so part of the process here is people are getting their pulse feedback. The opportunity is to take that feedback and then adjust the plan. And what we advocate for is not actually adjusting the goal statement, which is this statement, and not changing the survey question. But if there's anything inside the meat of the action plan, like I'm gonna focus on this over the next 30 or 45 days, that's where you would adjust it. So just to demonstrate that quickly, you can click on the pencil. And again, you're gonna leave the goal statement as is, you're gonna leave the behavioral statement as it is, but you can adjust anything within the body of the action plan itself. Did that clarify for you, Brian? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say I totally missed that before. And I'm sitting here thinking like, geez, what, I mean, it makes so much sense. That's like such a smart yeah. thing to do. Yeah, because I mean, I, I, it's funny. I, we, I talked to my client who's using this, my first test, about yeah. some, of the, some of the feed forward he received, but we didn't actually go in and revise this, which makes so much sense. So thank you so much for, I'm so glad you yeah. pointed that out. No. That's, that's great. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's easy to miss. Um, and also th this box is, you know, very intentionally just, it's an open box. So you can put anything in there that you want up to and including adding files and images. Um, but a simple format we use are just some concise bullet points for action items and then some concise bullet points for what support does the leader need to make improvement. So it's easy to forget to go back into that body of the action plan and, and maybe focus the next 30 days. But what's really critical here is if you change the behavioral statement or if you change the goal, it will actually change, it'll start a, a, a different round of, of feedback. So Brian, uh, Greg right now has three goals, create, uh, sorry, encourages open dialogue, creates a safe environment and then proactively recommends strategy. If I change one of those behavioral statements, it will add another behavioral statement here and start that measurement with that next round of pulse feedback fresh as if it's an entirely new goal. So it is key. If you want to measure something over, let's say, six months or a year, that the behavioral statement does not change. All right. Uh, a couple other items. Uh, we've got our project settings set up. We've, um, we have created that action plan. We've added those supporters. Uh, now, now it's time to start the pulse feedback process. So. Um, I'm just gonna go back to that pulse feedback page and walk through this and, and please feel free to jump in. And as always, we'd love feedback because we wanna make this process as easy as possible. So when you're ready to start the pulse feedback page, you're the pulse feedback process, you're gonna click on the pulse feedback link underneath each of your leaders who you're coaching. And then you have two options. You can request immediate feedback, meaning um, it will send out a pulse feedback round on demand, or you can automate the process. And this is probably the most common way to create your pulse feedback. So if you click on automate pulse feedback, again, you can see um, a sample of the pulse feedback survey that will go out. This will actually be Greg's survey. So you can double check and make sure everything is right. Uh, in the upper right-hand side, um, you'll see your project settings. In this particular case, we've got four feedback rounds. We're using a scale, the progress scale of negative two to positive two. Our, par our privacy setting is partially anonymous and the reminder emails are on. If you need to change any of those settings, you can just simply click on this link on the dashboard here or uh, on this page, or you can go back to the main dashboard page and click on the settings. And then if they're have been previous pulse feedback rounds that have been sent out. Those will be shown in this lower right-hand side. So to automate the pulse feedback process, you're gonna click on that box. And now this is where you're gonna have the chance to change the frequency. So even on this call, we've heard people are using you know, this in different ways. Bill, I think you said uh, you're sending out a pulse feedback round uh, every three months and Bill had, to, Bill had to leave at 1045, but I think he said every three months. Uh, we tend to send out pulse feedback about every 40 days. We used to do every 30, uh, but we, we got feedback from clients that we were over surveying them. Uh, but you could, you know, you can adjust that if, uh, you know, if you're using more of the Marshall Goldsmith methodology, where he thinks in terms of a mini survey that comes out every six months or maybe once a year, you can do that as well. So you can adjust the frequency of that survey and then you can adjust the date of that first round. And then that subsequent rounds will go out based on the frequency that you set. So let me pause there. This is an important page. Uh, what questions do you have about how to start the pulse feedback process? By the way, I love all these questions and it, it also helps us understand where we can improve the system too. So thanks. If, if you've got anything um, more, let us know. Brian, is this process clear for you as you're starting to ramp up on this new project? 
Um, yeah, and I have so the the one gentleman I'm working with on this right now, um, he's got strong opinions on things, and essentially mm -hmm. what we came up with was he, he wanted those to be sent out on uh, like a first Friday of the month, I think, or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, on a Friday, yep. it was his preference. Given the weekend, kind of thinking in terms of that, that might be when people just jump on there real quick and knock it out. Right. That's fine. Um, but ultimately, the exact number of days didn't quite tie out. So I have elected to set a reminder for myself to manually do it. I'd rather not do gotcha. that. Gotcha. Um, yeah. But I don't guess there's an option to say even like the next one is going to be on X date per se. Like, there's even, not even right one. Okay. Yeah, that that's a there's not that feature now, but that's really interesting to be able to not just do it based on number of days, but the third Friday of every month, almost like it's a repeating calendar invite in Google or Outlook or something. Yeah, I think I think his preference for trying this, and I thought, well, what I got to lose, I guess, um, it gotcha. is essentially. I think we did the first Friday every other month. Yeah, uh, it's okay. kind of the way that we we and that, but that gotcha. essentially, that's what we said. But I'm I'm manually doing it. It's not like yeah. The, so the, you're going in, you know. you're using this immediate pulse feedback request, and and then sending it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Any other questions, or how are you using it uh, in any different ways? It's also helpful to hear how people might be using the system differently. Yeah, I would love. Right. I, know, I know I've talked a lot, but I would love to hear if other people have been using it for a while and they've adjusted their frequency based on what they've experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what are what's the frequency you're using? Maybe John, Lori, Susan, Annalise, have you found a sweet spot for your coaching methodology? To me, it depends on the client. I find it best mm -hmm. when they initiate it because then they want to own it. And some people are, um, you know, every six months, some people, three months, some people, once you're done, it kind of depends on what challenges they're facing as a leader. It's such a powerful tool to get feedback um, after a very difficult time. Like we did one after we went to remote, everybody went to remote working. And that was great feedback because th there was a really yeah. recent challenging experience. But, um, mm -hmm. Can I finish that with a question? You mentioned something earlier yes. and I'm really in the crux of this. So I have a client I've been using this tool on four or five years and he's asking for another survey, but all his items like are going from like 4.6 to 4.7, duh, right? So I'm yeah. thinking about saying, let's just start again, maybe change the radius scale, yeah. maybe change the items, do a whole new project block. Don't even change what's out there, but create a new project for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I mean, has that been something you've I, been? I think that's great. I typically yeah. will do that, Susan. So um, we're starting some coaching with a COO of a, a technology company, and we're on our third or fourth round of coaching over the last yeah. three years. And mm -hmm. almost every new phase of coaching, I create a new project. Yeah. Yeah. I just so, think we're getting yeah, to the point and maybe change the rating scale. Yeah, you can change the rating scale. Typically for this particular <laughs> leader, he's focused on a different uh, set of behaviors for each of these mm -hmm. different phases. So it makes sense for him to have a fresh action plan and then, mm -hmm. um, and then create a new, uh, new you know, number of rounds of pulse feedback. So yeah, you can certainly create a number of uh, projects. And, th and then when that leader goes into mm -hmm. the system, they'll, they'll choose from any number of projects that you've been working on with them. And then one other quick follow-up question to the rating scale. You mentioned that in the um, change scale, you know, the plus three to yes. minus three, that people's previous rating comes up on that scale. Yes. I, had no, I didn't know that. Does that happen on yeah. the traditional scale? It, it happens on every scale. And that was, uh, that was a change. That I think we made that last year at some point, Robin. Okay. So, you know, one of the questions that we got, it, you know, pretty closely tied to the anchoring was, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what I rated this person 45 mm -hmm. days ago. Okay. And so when when that pulse feedback goes out, or if we just look at the survey, there dynamically there's new data that shows up in this section and right. it will show you 
what you rated, how you rated this leader in previous rounds of pulse feedback. Great. Got it. No, that was that yeah, was new news. Great. And, and uh, can I do one great. more? And then I shut Please up. Go, go um, for it. No, you're you good. Can you do more than three emails to people? Because the three emails go out every other day and then they're done. I think we were kind of yeah. talking around that a little bit. Can I just throw that into the mix that maybe we could generate the email um, frequency and that we might be able to send it out? Just something to think about. Yeah, it is. It's a good point. Um, we settled on three mostly because we we didn't want to be over surveying and then some depending on how what the frequency is between your pulse feedback rounds um like so let's say a, a, a let's say it's it today is uh what's the date today today's the uh today's uh the 22nd if my thank you for that it's friday um if i get a round of pulse feedback today and then the last round, the last reminder email was maybe 15 days ago. Those old links become, they, they become inactive, if you will. So um, that's an interesting idea. We haven't, we haven't considered that, but we'll, we'll, we'll give that some thought, Susan. Thanks. Um, I'd, like to add, I'd like to add a small yeah. thought on that as well. I think Great. That's a part that kind of gets me too. Um, and I'm wondering if, I don't know if it already says this, but that this will be active for a certain period of time or something. When I think through other tools mm. I've used where we're, where we're getting feedback, I, I will go out of my way to manually kind of send reminders to say only one week left or three days left and this is closing. Some of these folks just, you know, they think, well, uh, probably depending on how they work and where they work, they're used to getting reminders until they do something. Um, yeah, and, so and then I they know, don't do I it noticed, until the end. Yeah. And I, I noticed on this last one that, that mm, the participation really for this gentleman was much, much, much lower. And I don't know if yeah. that's because people thought, well, I'll just wait. Someone will tell me it's my last chance or something. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I, I love that idea. Yeah, I love that idea. And one thing- Even if the third one is this is your final reminder. Sorry. Yeah, even if that's great. Is this your final yeah. reminder. <laughs> I bet we could do that pretty easily. Great, thanks for that suggestion. I love it. A um, couple thoughts. Um, we think it's really key that the participant engages with supporters in between those pulse feedback rounds. It reminds them that they're using the data, that they're engaged in the process. We tend to see higher supporter engagement levels when that participant does that. Um, and then finally, one feature that you may or may not know about um, that I'll uh, very quickly show you um, and, and is there's this function that says send supporter email. So at any point in time, either the coach or the participant can send a message through coach metrics to their supporters. So if you notice maybe a drop off in engagement, we have three different types of, of messages here a welcome message, a follow-up message, and you can take this and customize it, um, or you can just create a custom message. Um, and so you can engage directly with those supporters. Um, and so that's an, also another nice way to, to keep them engaged in between, uh, in between the pulse feedback rounds. Um, I have a couple of other just quick points. Um, we already talked about integrating that action, the, the feedback back into the action plan, and updating that action plan. Um, and, and using the data in coach metrics during some of your coaching sessions. So in the stakeholder center coaching world, you would do an after action assessment. What'd you intend to do? What actually happened? Pull that data up. What did you learn from it and what's next? So that data can be used inside of your coaching sessions. And then a couple of other quick strategies that I'll mention, uh, I'll think about how you want to align that scale. So again, leadership circle one to five, uh, you might have one to seven. I know uh, DISC 363 for leaders has a one to seven scale. Ultimately, it's the conversations that matter. So enroll, enroll those supporters verbally and follow up verbally in between pulse feedback rounds to keep those in, in supporters enrolled, but also to, to learn from those conversations on how you can change, how that participant can change behavior. It also helps to change perception which I believe is harder to change in behavior itself. And then finally, I mentioned this earlier, but you can create a collection um, that has some sample action plans in it. 
or has some instructions on how to create your goals or um, so, so think about doing that. Let me see if I've got a, a sample really quickly that I can show you that we've done. Um, so if I go into my resources feature up here and I'm gonna scroll down all the way to the collections piece. Um, we created a, a 360 reflection process. Oh, we created a, a resource on how to create your action plan. So it gives them instructions to go to this part of the action plan. Uh, it has some specific instructions on how to create SMART goals, uh, how to create behaviors, and then action items. So they, they actually have a sample action plan um, that, um, uh, that will help guide them in, in the process. Part of what we're thinking about doing now is actually creating some videos on, you know, a two minute instructional video on how to create your action plan and then sending that to the participant. So they've got some support beyond a coaching conversation with you. So uh, let me pause here. We've got another minute left. Any other questions or can I support you in any way here as we start to wrap up today? Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Brian, as you get back in, Tasha, as you get back in, Lori, as you ramp up on your projects, shoot our support team messages. Let us know how we can support you. And again, we love your feedback. Thank you so much for joining us today, everybody, and have a great weekend.